You know, that voice of God, it uh, always challenges me, but I know with all the anesthesiologists in the audience, they just think it's another surgeon talking to them. Um, I'm, a, I'm a recovering surgeon, as probably many of you know. I can say that because, as you know, when you ask a surgeon to name the best three surgeons in the world, they always have trouble naming the other two. So I'm thrilled to be here with my friend and colleague, Joe Kiani. More to say about that in just a moment. You know, an idea eight years ago by a restless engineer spawned a global movement. Today, consisting of 4,000 plus hospitals, close to 5,000 hospitals in 46 countries, saving over 90,000 people. An exemplary example of what we call health diplomacy, uniting different countries, races, religions, ethnicities, and languages worldwide to act on a single value proposition patient safety. So Joe, when you're done with this, we could use you in government, maybe at the UN. You know, as Surgeon General of the United States, you have the privilege to serve the people. You're the top doc. The position has changed significantly over the last decade or two, but when I was there, I spent a lot of time around the world, speaking with allies, speaking with adversaries, going to the World Health Organization, Pan American Health Organization, trying to align our incentives and our safety and security of our nation with that of others. And what you learn is you never show up at your meeting and start your presentation with, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help you. As U.S. Surgeon General, the job description was to protect, promote, and advance the health, safety, and security of the United States. A deceivingly simple value proposition on paper, an extraordinarily difficult value proposition to execute on in a complex, hyperpartisan environment. But that job would be impossible to do without guys like Joe Kiani, who are passionate, selfless, and committed. Although he always gives all of you the credit, we all know it takes leadership. And Joe knows better than anybody that the synchronon of a leader is that you know you're responsible for the destiny of others. Joe was our azimuth. He keeps us on course and inspires us. So Joe, I want to be one of the many who Cheer Caesar on. Thank you so much for all you do. In this session, we will address pushing transparency and aligning incentives through policymakers. Sounds pretty simple. Transparency in itself is a big challenge. We can't move forward with aligning incentives and working with policymakers unless we've clearly defined this. What does transparency look like? Right now, to me, it looks kind of opaque, to tell you the truth. There's a lot we need to do to move forward on this. The elements necessary to achieve transparency are leadership from the top, understanding that as a leader, you are responsible for the destiny of others, whether you're in a small clinic or whether you're the Surgeon General of the United States or a hospital CEO. Leadership is predicated on integrity. Simple definition of integrity, doing the right thing when no one else is watching. Without integrity, without leadership, we can never hope to have full transparency. <clears throat> Stories like you've just seen are heartbreaking, but often they can humanize the statistics that we talk about here every day, because then it becomes personal. That could be our child. So as Surgeon General, I learned early on <clears throat> to find those people who had a story, who could pull at your heartstrings, that you don't think of the statistics anymore, you see the human side of this challenge. But it takes a brave, selfless family to come forward and challenge a system, the whole health system, like Scott Morris did, in telling his son Sam's story and driving necessary change in the British national health system, which went viral, which informs other health systems that it can be done with leaders like Scott and policymakers like Dr. Alden Fowler of the National Health System in Britain and Larry Smith of MedStar. And I've just been told that we're fortunate to have a congressman join us. I think he's on his way. I'm not sure he's here yet. But a brand new congressman from this district, Harley Ruda. Without these disciplines, there's nothing we can do to move this forward. It's a team approach, and Joe always talks about that. 
That's why you have a multidisciplinary audience. At every step along the way of that patient supply chain, each and every one of us has responsibility for patient safety. So today we'll have that discussion with the panelists. First and foremost, Scott, where are you, Scott? We owe Scott a great deal of gratitude because he exposed the most painful part of his life and his wife to make the world a better place. Scott, thank you very much. And now I'd like you to welcome our panelists up here. Larry, Scott, Eileen, come on up. Let's get started with our discussion. Is the congressman here yet? Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Harley Ruta, brand new congressman from the 48th District. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Glad to be so here. good to have you with us. Hi. Okay. Hey, Holly. Aiden, Aiden Fowler. Hi. Larry Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Nice right. to meet you. Thank you. Please. All right, everybody. Sit down in my living room. Let's solve this problem. So. Congressman, thank you for taking the time. First of all, I, I know that as a, as a brand new congressman, having met many of them over the years as Surgeon General, you're, you're still looking for the cafeteria and the, and the uh, bathrooms over there exactly. in the house. So, but uh, I really appreciate your commitment to patient safety and, and helping us get through this because uh, ultimately it's the policy makers who are gonna help drive this when you get all the good information from us. Scott, I wanna start with you. I mean, this was an extraordinary um, thing that you and your wife and your other children did to expose the, the, the pain that caused this, and yet you see how much good it's brought as setting an example because you took on the health system. You made them listen, and because of that, the NHS started to change. Tell us a little about you know, that commitment and, and how you decided to go forward. Um, well, I guess I'll start by saying it didn't start out as an act of courage. It was an act of self-preservation, and um, it was driven by feeling wholly unsafe after what we had seen happen and the feeling that there was no basis for trust that our children would be safe for the future. So it, it wasn't anything noble. It was really basic survival instinct, needing to know what had happened, why it happened, whether it could have been prevented. I didn't assume it could be, but I wanted to know if it could have been. And, and then with time, when I realized that actually the system was responding in a, in a way that was wholly unexpected by me, um, increasingly unsafe, just desperate to change it, and it just became a journey. So it was just a lot of little steps along the way. How receptive was the system in the beginning when you challenged well, it? Well, there is only any learning because of a complaint. I didn't complain for 15 months. I only complained in the end because I was advised to, in the sense that there was no other route to progress. So any learning that came from it was only driven by an adversarial process. And um, you know, in, in, in my view, that was unjust, um, not just for me, but also for the staff on the other end of that complaint. And it prolonged the trauma for all of us for a very long time. And it, it was a barrier to, to learning and improvement. Well, one of the things uh, I take away from your story, you always hear people say one person can make a difference. You did, and your family, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Larry, I want to ask you, you know, uh, being a leader in a large health organization like MedStar, yes. where you're an attorney and responsible for, for risk management, you're dealing with safety issues all the time. Yeah. Tell me what's, wh how you're dealing with that, especially the transparency part where it's so difficult to get people to be honest in this adversarial environment. <clears throat> Well, I'm blessed um, to be in an organization that, uh, from the top, uh, you mentioned in your comments that uh, to do this work, it takes leadership. Uh, and when we talk about leadership uh, in healthcare, we're really talking about making sure that as every organization, we start with the board and get them really to buy into what we're trying to accomplish, and then the administrative staff also supporting. This is not a ground up effort. It's got to be a top down initiative that really uh, focuses on. Uh, changing culture right. within an organization. It's not just making a modest change, it's changing the culture of the organization. <clears throat> so a couple things. One is I'd say that, um, as I started to say, I'm blessed to have an organization that I joined uh, knowing that they had that uh, intention. Weren't there yet, but when I interviewed for the job, I asked the question, uh, are you ready to start doing some of this work that's gonna change the way in which we, um, uh, we look at litigation? Um, you know, around the entire country, and for years and years, 
our response to um, these events that result in harm uh, have been driven by fear, fear of litigation. Um, um, Scott mentions in his, um, his uh, video the other drivers that push people in the other direction, that, that, that keep them from wanting to do transparency. Remember that the folks we're talking about are like you and I. I mean, they're just, they're individuals who come to work wanting to do a good job, wanting to do the right thing. Uh, and so um, the way we've done it at MedStar is taking that, um, that uh, direction from the top and then started one case at a time, trying to see if we couldn't deal with those cases differently. And, and, I, and, I, and all of you, I think, at this point know about Candor, but I wanna, I wanna talk about a little bit more than just the process. Um, what it takes, really, is um, keeping in mind um, what Scott said, which is the first thing we should think about is the patient. The second thing we should think about is the patient and the family. And then we should talk about what can we provide by way of support. Mm -hmm. So let me just mention, if I can briefly, um, the only way that um, this program will work is if in the first instance as we start the conversation with the family and the patient, our emphasis, our thoughts, are not about what's gonna happen with litigation, not what's gonna happen if we get caught. It's gonna be what can we do to help this family, and, our, and by the way, help our staff deal with this. And when we do that, let me, uh, um, uh, for those who might try this, you can't do it based on uh, an, assess, uh, an assessment that malpractice has occurred. You can only do it on the basis that a harm, unexpected, has happened to this family or this patient. And then you start the same process, whether it's uh, 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 um, going to be, whether it uh, turns out to be a, a deviation from the standard of care, or whether it's the best care in the world. The harm is what we're focused on, and the support for that harm is what we're focused on. People have asked me if we uh, later on find out that we didn't do anything wrong. What do we do? Well, what we do is say, we really um, want to help you now in the transition from where we've been providing support to finding other support for you. So we've heard some key terms, trust, transparency, to be able to move something like this forward. Now I'll then, from uh, also a surgeon who is, was a clinician and has plenty of experience with boots on the ground taking care of patients, and a leader in the national health system in Britain, tell us the impact that Scott's testimony has had for the national health system in improving. Well, testimonies like that have had a huge impact. Um, it, there's been this big sea change, and I think um, there have been a number of things. There are cases like Scott's. There are cases, uh, as we were talking about yesterday, of the hospital crisis in, in mid-Staffordshire and so on that have really changed the way we think about these issues. And it's just very striking listening to Scott talking about how 15 months after he's having to pursue the route of complaints and litigation to get answers, compared with the story we heard about yesterday of Jack Gentry, where the surgeon went straight to him, told him what had gone on, and there was an attempt to redress immediately. And all that learning can be harvested at that time, whereas what we see in the case of Sam was that we had to wait so long to get that learning and what had happened in the meantime. So things have changed. Uh, we have a duty of candor where we are, and I think the duty of candor is less about telling people they have to be open because I think people naturally want to be, it's permitting people to. And society isn't necessarily always taught to be open. So if we have a motor vehicle accident, we are told not to admit liability. So it's, it's in people's nature to be protective, but we have to understand what stops them being transparent, what holds them back from it. So we have a new Secretary of State for Health um, who's been in the job only six months. He's not from a healthcare background, and um, I met him recently. He said, I do not understand. He's worked out already. I do not understand. You're in a high-risk industry where mistakes are made. Why are you so embarrassed to talk about them? because this is your normality. So what are the barriers and how do we approach them? We've really got to understand what the barriers are because it's not a simple thing. Right. It's multiple things. It's not just litigation. In the case of England, it's not just the coronial system that does scare people. It's this adversarial nature of it and the fear of, and, and you and I both know that it's not easy to go to someone and say, look, we made the wrong call here. We made a mistake. And it's not usually just one thing. And so what we're actually talking about is a series of potential opportunities that have been made by multiple people, and we've got a corporate responsibility for talking through all of those, uh, because generally what we find when things go badly wrong is there's five or six steps 
where it could have right. been avoided. Right. So, you know, some of us are old enough to remember um, uh, The House of God, the yeah. book and movie back in the yeah. 70s, yeah. which that wasn't about patient safety, but embedded in all of these adverse events was patient safety issues there. Yeah. And then we have to err as human back in 99 with the, then the Institute of Medicine calling it out. And, and when you look at that title, to err as human, implies that people will make mistakes. Yeah. It's not perfect. And so I, I think that, as you already pointed out, Larry, that it's important for us to start to be able to look at the difference between uh, neglect, malfeasance, and an honest error. And, and so I, I will ask the Harley, from, as, as an attorney, I mean, we live in this adversarial society. Can we get to a point where it's not good guy, bad guy, but we can actually look at this and make some good informed decisions that don't prevent transparency from happening because people are scared to talk? Well, full disclosure, as you're a recovering surgeon, I am a recovering attorney. <laughs> I've been on the wagon for about 20 years. And, uh, uh, and being a, a member of Congress is much like being an attorney. You're a jack of all trades, master of none. So I'm probably the uh, least qualified person to be on this panel. Uh, but the reality is, yes, we've got to address it. You know, we have uh, approximately 200,000 deaths in U.S. hospitals annually. And, and Scott's uh, uh, situation is, is, is one story of many that happens every day in our country and, and across the globe. And the cost that's associated with that from litigation and, uh, and settlements right. uh, certainly adds to the fact that we spend 18.5% of our GDP on health care. So we've got to get it addressed. And by the way, that's just the deaths. That doesn't include all the other mistakes Morbidity. that take place that uh, also add a price tag to our medical care here. And in, and in spending 18.5% of our GDP on health care, that's twice what the European Union nations spend. So we know that we have an opportunity to get cost out of the system, and this is a really important one. So we need transparency. Yep. We also need common data that is shared across the platform right. so that people can fully understand how to address this problem in a more uh, uh, concerted effort uh, to bring these costs down and, and more importantly, avoid uh, uh, avoidable deaths. Right. Well, thanks for those comments, and they're, they're very insightful, uh, especially that we're spending over $3 trillion a year on what we call health care, and actually it's sick care. It's not health care that we spend the money on, and uh, it's pushing 19%, estimated to be even more. And so buried in there are all of the preventable deaths, and as you pointed out as well, I think it's important. We're here to prevent patient death, obviously, but the morbidity is astronomical as well, the complications, the harm that's done for a person who lives, but they may not live as well as they used to live because of those mistakes. How do we get to that point where people feel free to be able to express? Now, we spoke about this. Right? You guys have created that culture within MedStar that um, you know, people are willing to say, look, I made an error here, mm -hmm. okay? So talk to us how you built that culture that people feel free and, and, uh, and transparency can thrive rather than opaqueness where people are scared. Well, it, it's a great question. I, I want a full disclosure. MedStar is on, I, I think yesterday somebody said, we don't like the term journey. We want to get action. MedStar is on a journey. This is not an overnight phenomenon. We have not achieved 100% cultural change within MedStar. We've got, I've got, um, we've got uh, 2,500 physicians who work for MedStar. We've got another couple of thousand that provide services in private practice. We haven't reached all of them. They're not, they're not there yet. Many of them are still suffering from the same fears and concerns uh, that drove them to go in the, in the direction of the old system uh, to begin with. But we're getting better. And th this is one of the things I think that's really important about the cultural change and coming from the top. Um, I, I, Aiden is absolutely right. It isn't about teaching people to do the right thing. It's allowing them to do the right thing. And I, I've said many times, again, my job is so easy. All I have to say when one of these events is reported to me and the staff asks, what do we do? Do what you think is right and we'll support you. Let me know if you need my support, but just do what is right. I would say that once you start that process with an organization, be careful if you don't mean it. Because once you start saying those things to your staff, if you don't live up to those uh, principles, your staff will, will turn against you. They'll realize that this is just hollow, uh, another, another uh, program of the month rather than a uh, change in the way in which we do business. Okay. So once that starts to happen, it's like wildfire. No, I'm sorry for the reference, but uh, here in California, but it's like wildfire. It starts small, <laughs> and it just keeps on building and building and building. In this case, I don't want to control it. I want it to go out of control. I want it to go from our organization to every right. organization in the country. So um, 
on this issue of, of transparency, one of the challenges that I, I see is that um, as we move forward with this concept, and I'll ask you to talk about it, Aiden. Um, as I look at it, there's, there's two paths we can take. An honest, good physician making an error, we can call that a teachable moment. Yep. The chief of surgery, chief of medicine, chief of ICU brings that person in and says, you know, you made an error. Let's talk about this. Versus punishment. If all there is is punishment, you're never going to get the transparency. So how have you approached that within NHS so that we can uh, have people move more toward a transparent system where we use more teachable moments when indicated? Yeah, and I think, I think it's complex. I think there are a lot of things going on, and um, I would talk about some of the key things. So, for example, uh, we are introducing um, a medical examiner model. So, for death, and as you say, it's not just about death, it's about harm, but this is a starting point. Um, what will happen is all, all deaths will be examined and uh, opportunities for learning will be looked at. And this will be clinicians who can then support the team and say, look, we're concerned, or the family's concerned, something went on here, and support them and talk through what went on in essentially virtually real time. So none of the 15-month delay. I think we need to think about how we reproduce that supportive model for other harms and not just deaths. But I think it's a, it's a good starting point amongst it. Um, I think culturally getting comfortable with these things is difficult, but it's that support mechanism. And as you say, it comes from the leadership. So I remember talking recently about a case where um, somebody, a, a, an orthopedic surgeon in the States had made an error, and he went to his boss, his, his director, and the guy said, stuff happens, suck it up. And he ended his career then. Right. Now we have to move on from that sort of thing where the, the right people are in leadership models, where they understand that this has an impact both on patients and family, but also on the staff, and are much more supportive about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is changing over time. But as you say, yeah. culture change takes time. It doesn't happen instantly. Well, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Just follow up on that. So you all saw Jack Gentry uh, yesterday. And, and uh, he's obviously one of my heroes. He's also a friend. And uh, I know a lot more about the back story in uh, Jack's case um, than most. And one of the back stories was the surgeon who did the surgery is a wonderful surgeon and a great human being. Yes, he, and he was the perfect person for this to happen because he knew what to do right away and did the right thing. But he said to me at one point, uh, months, months after, thank God what happened to me as a surgeon happened at MedStar or in an organization where I could do what I wanted to do. Otherwise, I would have had to bury this somehow and live with that for the rest of my life. Yeah. Jack and um, Justin Tortolani, the physician, are great friends, Teresa and Jack. Um, uh, still uh, have a great relationship with Justin Tortolani. That's what can happen when you do the right thing and you can actually help heal the caregivers in addition to healing the patients. But it's, it's all parts of the system aligned. So we've, we've got a very high profile recent case um, where a doctor was convicted of gross negligence manslaughter where the trust were very supportive. The coronial system, which I believe you don't have here, but the coroner was the one that pushed for prosecution. So unless all the parts of our system are aligned, we've still got a problem. Well, besides the alignment, one of the things that I can recall, having been a chief of surgery and, and uh, running a hospital and a health system, um, you can have physicians who want to be honest about it, or a nurse for that. Let's not just say physicians. It's anybody in that chain. But um, you have chiefs of service who are worried about their metrics, the numbers that they have to report. Okay? You have a hospital CEO who knows they're getting rated by various... Uh, oversight groups that are worried. So the culture has to change throughout the organization. Yeah. So Scott, tell me how you addressed that when you were talking to the NHS, realizing that this was multifactorial from the bottom up to the top. Well, rather than thinking in terms of how it's been addressed, because I would say we're at the very beginning of the journey, what's changed really is that the conversation has moved on. I'm not sure for frontline staff, reality has changed yet. Okay. So I think the barrier to zero is the culture of fear. I don't actually think, I think Joe yesterday described it as a culture of apathy. I would describe it as a culture of fear. I don't think any of my, any of the people I've met or any of my friends who work in healthcare are apathetic, but I do think they're afraid of how the system will treat them. Yes. And it's the fear that needs to be rooted out. And I think actually yes. when that happens, you'll get closer yes. to zero. 
And um, in, in the context of that, this is where policymakers and legislators really matter because they are the people that have to change the laws so that we don't punish error. We learn from error, but we do punish cover-up, we do punish bullying, we do punish scapegoating. And we actually get to a point where not only do you not have to wait 15, th in my case, 13 months, 15 months for a complaints form, but you don't then also have to wait for five or six years right. for the result of that because the feedback loop yes. and the speed of it is really critical. Yes. Yeah, Harley, I wanted to ask you, I, I just wanted to ask you something because, you know, you, you, you're, you're hearing the fear in the system, mm -hmm. people trying to protect their brand, people trying to protect uh, themselves. Um, obviously, you're, you, you know, we're not asking you for any commitment. I, but I just, as, as, a, as an attorney and a new congressman, tell us your thoughts on how we might move forward to free this burden for people who want to be honest. Well, you know, I'm obviously I'm working in the greatest bastion of dysfunctionality in, in the United <laughs> States, uh, as we see with the uh, government shutdown we're dealing with right now. Thank you for your service. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the question I actually want to ask you guys is that uh, you know, we have to overcome uh, the culture of trying to uh, not allow this information to, to be transparent. So if you get the transparency, there also has to be, I believe, an economic tipping point, right? right. If, if, if the cost of, of being non-transparent is better than the cost of being transparent, right. Right. then we haven't had the economic tipping point that we need to move forward. So I'm right. really curious from your sure. viewpoint especially, because right. you've, as a company, you've made the decision right. Right. that it is cheaper to be transparent, more economically feasible yes. to be transparent than, than to try and cover it up. We didn't know that. We didn't know that when we began. One of the, um, the leaders that I had to spend some time with in the very beginning was our CFO, um, who was obviously uh, concerned that I was uh, heading us in the right financial direction. And I said to him, um, and, and I said to the board, I can't tell you, I don't know yet. We don't have enough um, experience with this model to know whether it is uh, less or more economically um, advantageous for healthcare. But it's the right thing, and I've always felt that in doing the right thing, I know I sound like a Pollyanna, that you end up with good results. I can now tell you, although our, our program, as, 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 uh, as robust as it is, doesn't capture 100% of the events as it should and work with them through this uh, process, it captures some percentage fairly significant, maybe 25, 30, 40%. And over the last four years, the only way I can measure whether this program is successful is looking at it in the context of what we spend for malpractice, um, both, uh, the, uh, we're self-insured. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a direct relationship to the, uh, the money that's spent. And over the last four years, I, I, I try to be very careful when I give this information out because I don't want to overstate the, um, the reality. We have saved um, upwards of $20 million a year on the funding that we put into our captive insurance company against what our actuary tells us we should be putting in based on what um, he, um, projects our spending should be for the kind of oh. program we have, number of physicians we have, uh, our history. Larry, what's that percentage savings? Well, it is, uh, it's about a 20% savings. Okay. So a very substantial saving. We're about $100 million a year. I would hope that you all would publish that. Well, we are. <laughs> but I want to say, say in that publication, I can't, uh, the holy grail of risk management is being able to say, we put this inter inter intervention in place and we got this result. I can't do that. This is too complex. Right. It's a piece, it's a part of a mosaic that includes all the work that's being done mm -hmm. um, through uh, this wonderful organization looking at sepsis prevention. So that isn't the same as what I'm doing on the litigation side. All those things go in to create a better, safer environment right. that also has as a component this uh, transparency initiative that works right. when there is error or when there's harm. So I can't say any one of those, but what I can say, as I said to our CFO, I don't, know what's, I don't know what's causing it to happen, specifically, but I think it's all. So we can't stop any, okay. and we've got to keep on building on it. Scott, you had a comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, in terms of a uh, financial tipping point, um, the reason it hasn't been recognized is because the cost isn't counted. Right. And actually, the cost is staff turnover, it's burnout, it's suicide. Absolutely. And it's the loss of trust between everybody that is involved in this, and that harm goes on 
for lifetimes unless there's mediation and resolution and you know driving towards a just culture is about capturing all of that. Well, is it, that's a key point because well, you're covering the hard cost yes, and that's the that's soft right. cost, right. which right. the time and effort and, and misery that is hard to put a, a tangible number on. And it's not just felt by me, it's my wife, it's my children, one of whom lost a brother, the other of whom never met a brother. Okay. It's our wider families, but it's also every member of staff that watched him die. And they all went home to their children the same night. Right, right. And they weren't supported because they were locked in an adversarial right. process. And they, you know, some of them were actively blocked from helping tell us what had happened. Right. Right. So right. what did that feel like? So let me um, give a little historical perspective that I think there's probably many people here from Orange County and Joe and some others. And so when we talk about patient safety, I I'm thinking back in my own career where I was a general vascular surgeon. I subspecialized in trauma burns and critical care. But the, the basis for our trauma system here in the United States today was a report done in the 1970s by a Dr. West here in Orange County who was a surgeon who reported on preventable deaths from trauma right here in Orange County. And that changed the whole landscape nationally where they saw that there was a significant amount of patients that were dying from simple things, a pneumothorax, a collapsed lung, bleeding that wasn't stopped appropriately, an airway that wasn't managed you know, in the field. This is when paramedicine was just starting. So we forget that there have been people working before in this area, although we didn't have a patient movement like we do today and we didn't have a Joe Chiani, but there were people that recognized 40 years ago and more that we were missing things. And so today, it's taken us almost a half a century to have a discussion like this about transparency. You know, so I think we're heading in the right direction. But the next thing we probably need to talk about is metrics. Okay, so... Um, one of my colleagues, Atul Gawande, talk about a checklist, you know, taken from pilots. Let's talk about checklists. Let's talk about metrics. And to your point, like, is there some way we can measure this to be able to demonstrate that we are making progress? Who wants to start? Well, I can start on that. Okay, I mean, thanks. It's, it's interesting you were talking about um, trauma because trauma is one of the areas where, by using the data and being open about it, we've been able to change and show real measurable difference in the outcomes from trauma by revising our trauma system. So we've gone to fewer trauma centers managing trauma. Now that was a difficult battle because people didn't want to give up this work, but we used the data in a very open way to say, we're not where we should be. We admitted we could be better, and that, that had a real impact. But patient safety is hard to measure. Yes. So we talk about what's avoidable and preventable. How do we decide that? So in my own practice, I might say, you know, I. So I was a colorectal surgeon for 10 years, and I kept a very tight eye on what went on. And in that time, I had six deaths from planned surgery. And I can remember the detail pretty much of all of them. And sometimes it, there were clear-cut opportunities. So a patient who died of C. diff, clearly that's an institutional issue that we should have avoided. But sometimes it's not clear-cut. So it's really difficult sometimes to define it. So I mean. if I did an operation, if I did surgery after I'd been up at night doing on-call and maybe I lost a little more blood than I would have done and they got transfused, then they had a cardiac event three days later, was that preventable as a death or wasn't it? So I think it is really difficult to define. And where we're working, we've got a new strategy for patient safety being developed now is to say, let's measure what we can and demonstrate impact there, knowing that if we tried to measure patient safety and harm across the whole system, we've got to do 20,000 note reviews with global trigger tools, invest that huge amount of resource that could be used for action on patient safety. So we have enough data, we have a, a, a reporting system that gives us two million incident reports a year, and three quarters of that out of interest is actually no harm data. So we've got to get better at reading that and understanding where we can have the greatest impact and measure the metrics of that. So if we're doing work on healthcare-associated right. infections, it is easier to measure levels of that yeah. than it is global harm. So Just I think we're focusing the metrics where they can have most one, impact. One uh, issue, of course, is um, you know, the variability in care. Yeah. People te do different things, and they think it's right. You know, every physician feels they were trained the best they, they could, and so the variability is something that challenges us as we relate to this yeah. because it's hard to define best practices, okay? Yes. Because everybody thinks they're doing a best practice, yet we have the opportunity now through technology, through aggregating data, through machine learning, predictive analytics, that we can get better at this as we go on. But we 
have to put the data into the system. And we've got better at that. So yes. we've got national reporting of data, and you were a vascular surgeon. That was one of the first to go. So this started with cardiac surgery. And of course, everyone thought the world would end. This data would be out there, they'd be picked upon, the world would end. Actually, what happened was a few people realized that they shouldn't be doing what they were doing and stopped, but the world carried on turning regardless. Yes. And what we saw was people understanding where they sit and wanting, nobody wants to be, right. as somebody was saying yesterday, nobody wants to be at the bottom of the pack. Um, so it's understanding that they could be better and change. And that drove changes to the way we do the vascular surgery and how we centralize it, et cetera, et cetera. So we have started to use that in my own practice. We had data out there. My data was on the system. Of course, it's sometimes difficult to interpret. When you're talking about small numbers of something, you get into the statistics of it. And we get quite defensive of that. And you know, we're sitting here talking about being transparent. Just before I left, we had a freedom of information request about deaths from medication errors. And I found myself trying to explain it away. So a paper wants to publish that we have deaths from medication errors. Right. And I'm there saying, well, of course, it's really difficult to know whether it caused the death. And I think, well, hold on. In my physicianly attempt to manage this data, Am I actually being other than transparent? Because we know there's an issue here, so why don't we just say, yes, we know there's an issue with deaths from medication errors and not overcomplicate so it. The, as I see, the checklist has been a valuable adjunct that pilots have used for years, a tool, you know, bought it in, wrote the book about it. But to me, that's a macro approach. Is the ET tube in the right place? Did you amputate the right extremity? Those kind of things. How do we get down to a micro level where we have automation in the system, the technology can help us as well to be able yeah. to take the variability out of that and, and hence make it safer for our patients. Yeah. Well, and one of the things um, that has come out of our effort on Candor about transparency is that it does allow us to do a really in-depth analysis. Um, I think David uh, Mayer mentioned yesterday, we don't call it root cause, we, um, we uh, call it an event review, and try to get to understand as best we can what took place. And um, uh, that's allowed us to involve uh, human factors engineers, allowed us to involve other professionals that can actually help us make the difference in uh, how we continue to provide care. So you, you start moving, as we've been talking about, from a litigation and fear environment to a learning environment that produces change. Mm -hmm. And so this is all, uh, so, and I, and I also agree, um, in, in, as you're talking, we can't be tripped up by trying to be too precise. We know we've got a massive problem. Mm. Um, I think the data we're looking at is directional and not specific. Good. And so I think if we can just uh, focus our attention on what those directional data tell us and keep going in that direction, we're better off. Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to do now is we have a lot of questions from our audience. They want to talk to all of you. So let me uh, go through some of these and, and uh, we'll pass them on. Uh, here is one. If we believe that providers want to do the right thing, how much do you think provider burnout, well-being, and the other burdens of the profession, EHR documentation, for example, lead to a lack of willingness to be transparent. Anybody want to grab that? Start, Larry? Sure, I'll, I mean, I'll start. Um, there, there's no question that they're interconnected. Uh, we've uh, just begun at MedStar looking again at our peer review process because uh, the peer review process is seen, seen um, in our organization, as I think it is in most, as a punitive process rather than a constructive process. And, but we've tied that together by saying our efforts should be looking at the whole clinician, whether it's a nurse, physician, uh, or any other clinician. So we look at their expertise and their, and their knowledge and their skill and ability, but we also want to look at how they're doing in terms of their own wellness. Um, how are they psychologically, physically? And we also want to look at their citizenship. How do they, how do they perform in our culture? Do they accept the norms we have? Right. So I, I think if yeah. we uh, focus on that, I think we'll help folks yeah. do better. I think the premise here is that Providers want to do that. I think they do want to do it, yes. but have we created an environment that frees them to do it? I mean, as a chief, I remember looking at all of the morbidity and mortality reports. And what remember in the old days, what we would do is blind it. It would be surgeon A, surgeon B. But everybody in the room knew who surgeon A was and surgeon B and C because you knew the cases they were doing. And of course, when you had those discussions, you don't understand my patient was sicker than the rest. And you have all of the excuses because you're trying to protect your, your silo and make your chief look good and make your hospital look good because there's reporting there. We're not there yet, but I think we're making significant progress. Let me move on to the next one. Harley, this one is for you. Uh, 
Secretary of Health in UK required all of NHS hospitals to be transparent and publish regularly their preventable harms. Are we ready to do that in US hospitals? Yes, we are, if we can get Congress and the Senate and the President to agree. That's always gonna be the challenge. And, and this kind of goes back to uh, part of the conversation about when you were talking about at the micro level. First of all, we've got to have uh, standardized uh, data protocol that we're able to accumulate at that level and, and, and then use that data to, be, uh, to provide the appropriate analysis. But I do think one of the challenges that we're going to have, and I'd like to hear your guys' input on this, is that you know, this, as much as patients and the public want medicine to be scientific, it's not. There's a lot of art and, and, and human yeah. interaction yeah. And, and involvement in error. So I, I'm, I, I wonder how we get consistency in transparent data when you have so much human inter interaction and in, in the artistry of medicine involved. Right. Well, give us your experience and then let it, Scott comment. It's, it's not straightforward. I mean, if, if you start with the premise you want people to be open, that's great but actually there's a lot of complexity along the way with that. And what we find at the moment is that very strong organizations are very open. What we see is that if you look at our, our CQC, our inspectorate ratings, the outstanding trusts, staff report that they feel able to speak out, et cetera, et cetera. What we often now find is that if you look at really strongly performing trusts across the system, they report, for example, never events at a higher rate than other organizations, which seems surprising. And the risk is that while you're going through this process of encouraging openness, the ones who are willing and step forward start to look out of kilter. They start to look like the worst. Right. So you've got to be able to manage that. And we live in a world, and I'm sure it's the same here, where um, we are very heavily scrutinized, and that's appropriate. And we had a session on journalism yesterday. People are looking at this, and we've just got to be careful that there isn't a punishment for inadvertently for being honest and open reporting. And, that, and we, we have disparate parts of the system and we're trying to align that better. And some parts will say, well, we want to go in and manage this because that's the expectation of us. So we want to respond to this in a way that may discourage the reporting. So you've just got to be careful how you... But that tone is set from the top. Yeah, it's, the chief it's of the ownership service. from the top and, and, it's, it's what and I, making sure, and one of my roles is yes. to stop people leaping in. I have organizations who are open, they say, we've got an issue with never events, we want support. One of the things right. I sometimes have to do, to be honest, is go to other parts of the system and say, back off, right. let us Again, it's that, support it's this. that teachable moment versus yeah. the punishable moment. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's the leader that has to make that decision with the appropriate data, as you said, with the appropriate policies in place, that there's a departure. So when you start to see a trend, as opposed to, to one thing. Okay. So I, I think, Holly, we're, we're moving in that direction, but we need better data, better systems in place to look at those variable practice patterns which often lead to these problems. Scott, you have a comment? Just to sort of counter the, the proposition, um, the practicing of medicine and the, the delivery of healthcare may have an element of art, but actually the process of understanding stuff when it's gone wrong that could be scientific. There's no need for there to be art in that. Right. Right. Actually, you need yes. skills yes. for right. conversation, <laughs> interpretation, expertise, objectivity, a whole load of things. We don't have people with those skills. We don't train them. We have media teams. We have litigation teams. But we do not have safety investigators. Right. We don't have media. Well, I think what you're talking, you know, in, in, what we would call that in the science world would be health literacy. Yeah. How do we take very complex science, the most complex science the world has ever known, translate it in a culturally competent, health literate manner, deliver it to that end user we call a patient who may have a high school education, okay, and now they understand it and the expectations can be set. Yeah. Right now there's a big gap. You're absolutely right. Okay. So well, we'll our our expectation has been people can just do this without any support training. This isn't what they were trained to do and we have to do that. And, and part of what we're doing is more training around investigation yeah. and response right. and resolution. And, and that's where we need transparency, is honesty about the fact that that has not been normal. No. That isn't the reality that people work in. We it's what we want and it's, that's actually the goal. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like right. it very quickly. If you're yes. going to do this kind of work as an organization, you have to put resources <laughs> into the program. Yeah. You can't expect it's just going to happen without resources. Yeah. And, and train people who know how to deal with these issues um, is yeah. extremely important. Yeah. Here's another uh, great question. With transparency, are you saying there should never be complaints to health departments for hospitals or medical boards for doctors? Do you think teachable moments can replace medical board complaints with a doctor uh, who has multiple victims? <coughs> I, I, I don't know that the, the word would be victims, but... Uh, 
No, you should always have a right to complain. The system should Absolutely. always expect that there's a right to complain, but it doesn't mean that you should rely upon complaints right. for safety. It doesn't replace the system right. that we have, the, the system we have already to monitor physician, nurse, allied health professional performance. This is an adjunct. Yeah. I've been doing this work uh, for a long time, uh, most of my life, and um, what trips us up are the small percentage of clinicians who are not competent to provide the services they're providing, and we are, as an industry, woefully inadequate in trying to find ways in which we can identify them and either uh, correct uh, their behavior or, or, or their skills or, quite frankly, get them out of the business. And we've got to start doing that. These folks can't destroy the effort of so many good people who are trying to do the right thing. Harley, Harley, oh, thank you. That's a good one. Harley, I have a question here directed for you, but um, I'm looking uh, through a, a HIPAA lens. It's about a personal issue. Is it all right that I sure. bring it up? <clears throat> So to Harley Rhoda, I understand that you almost died from C. diff after back surgery three summers ago. Tell us how that will shape your thoughts and plans after all you've learned here. Well, it might be a little overstated, but yes, I did have a, uh, I had back surgery effusion, and uh, shortly after that, uh, feeling really horrible a few days later uh, and not wanting to go back to the hospital, I was, uh, uh, my whole family forced me back to the hospital. And what's interesting when you go into the emergency room, uh, you can quickly find out how bad of shape you are in and how they process you. And, uh, <laughs> and I've been to the ER many times, either personally or with four kids. And uh, we, I was quickly moved back and the hazmat suits came out and, uh, and they started treating me. So it was, uh, uh, it was an interesting uh, to go through it. And it was, and it was uh, also humbling and, and horrible to see the other people on that floor uh, what they were going through. And I know that the death rate for those that are 65 and older is fairly high. Um, uh, and, and to hear patients being told that, uh, you know, part of their intestines were going to be taken out and, uh, or, or worse outcomes, uh, uh, you know, it made me realize just how uh, difficult that situation is and how preventable it is by making sure that we have sanitary uh, facilities. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was certainly um, uh, something that, that has pushed me forward to help try and address the issues that we see in hospitals that Scott and so many others have experienced firsthand. Jim, Cobb. Okay, we'll go, next, we'll go to another one then. Most of the questions that are here that are, are very similar are like, how do we alter the blame culture of our, of our, in our society? You know, the adversarial system that, you, that you're going to get sued no matter what. Can I, can I? Please. So uh, some of you had a chance, I hope most of you had a chance to see John Shakur uh, yesterday in a, um, a panel. Uh, John is a defense, is a plaintiff lawyer who sues me uh, more often than I'd like to, um, to report. <laughs> and um, somehow we've created an, an, unho an unholy alliance, uh, John and I. And I went to him, uh, let me just say, I guess, sort of boldly or, or generally, um, we can't do the work we're talking about by just talking to ourselves uh, within healthcare. We need patients, and uh, we're doing a much better job now of bringing patients and the families uh, uh, that they represent to the table. Um, we need um, representatives of our government to think this through with us. We also need the plaintiff bar. This is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is not gonna change because we tell it to change. So I brought John in-house uh, to MedStar, and we've indoctrinated him into our way of thinking. Uh, and quite often, John will call me when he's got a, uh, something he thinks might, as he say, fits the Candor model, and we'll evaluate it, and if it looks like something that should uh, be resolved, we'll uh, work with him to quickly do that. So I think one of the things we need to do is start um, working with those on the other side to learn how okay. to do it better. Well, unfortunately, this could go on for hours. We only have a couple of minutes left, so I would like each of the panelists to just give a, a, a short closing comments on you know, some takeaway messages for our audience. We'll start down at the end with Dr. Fowler. Oh, you give me the difficult bit. I have to start. Um, <laughs> I think it's really difficult to come up with one key point at this point. But this stuff is, these are wicked problems. And they're going to take time and they're complex. And we've got to go at it a bit at a time. But because it's difficult doesn't mean we don't go there. We just have to keep going at it. And it's going to be hard stuff. We've got to stop this attitude of telling people not to be human because right. they're going to continue being human. <laughs> and we do that a lot. And we say, we'll write you guidelines. We'll tell you not to do stuff. And we're surprised sure. constantly that okay. stuff happens. We name things never events and don't understand why people still keep having them. So there's a lot about 
as you say, with patient safety, designing out supportive stuff, using the technology. We had a session talking about that to get on top of some of these. Thank issues. you, sir. Scott. Um, the, the objective I would like to see for healthcare all around the world is that the whole system in every country is focused on a just culture which treats everybody with respect and kindness and fairness and as if it was their child. You know, you treat everybody in that sense, in some sense, in, in the way you love. You've got to create psychological safety so that everybody feels safe, whether they're delivering care or receiving care, and then we will be able to get towards the goals that everybody aspires to. Harley? Thank you, Scott. I'd just like to thank the rest of the panel and all of you because of the initiative that you are driving here is so important to all of us, all of our families. And also thank you, Joe, for your leadership in, uh, in, in directing this. It's, uh, uh, I figure any guy who can graduate from high school at age 15 and have a college degree and a master's by age 22 is the perfect guy to be leading this uh, initiative. Thank you. <laughs> Learn. I'll actually stand on Scott's comments. I think if we can look at this um, as uh, treating our family whenever we're dealing with these issues and what we want to have happen to them, I think we would be in a much better place very quickly. And last but not least, I would say that uh, I've learned a lot today. And as I look at this as a big picture, as if I was a certain general still looking at this, it's about changing a global culture that embraces transparency so that we can get to where we want to be to have absolute patient safety. Thank you all. Please thank our panel. <clears throat>